Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Module 3 of our Introduction to Data Science webinar series, Advanced Supervised Learning. Thank you for joining us this morning, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Aman. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the third module in this series, Decision Trees and Random Forest. I picked Random Forest as one example of what I would call an advanced uh, supervised uh, machine learning uh, technique. Um, and, and the reason why I picked this is because decision trees are uh, a little a little bit different from regression. Actually, they're really quite different from regression. Um, but not only that, but random forest was what I would say to be one of the real first real breakthroughs in, in machine learning. And it was one of the um, runaway successes in the early 2000s uh, when people were still fiddling with uh, some neural networks that really did not suit the task or, or and it really were not much better than regression. Random Forest really changed the game and, and it started and people started to take machine learning much more seriously. Um, so yeah, so on 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 um, uh, Thursday we'll be going through some code that illustrates random forest uh, with some healthcare data that has a lot of uh, variables, and you'll see just how how powerful this is in comparison to um, regression. Um, but just to say that unlike the previous uh, modules, you won't need to know much about uh, regression or much uh, statistical knowledge, even though some of the basic concepts of random forest are um, based in some pretty uh, sound statistical things, namely the bootstrap. So if you wanted to, the, to get a more in-depth uh, knowledge of this topic, I would say that um, chapter nine in, in elements of statistical learning and, uh, and chapter 15 in that book uh, are, are quite good, um, but uh, you, I'll show you more about that at the at the end of the the presentation. So to give you an outline of what I'm going to cover in this hour, first I'm going to talk about decision trees. They're a, a conceptually simple but uh, very inaccurate learner. So it's the, this is one of the real benefits about random forests is that they use this concept of decision trees, which correlates almost exactly with your intuitive understanding of what they would be. Um, but they, you know, they, they use that as a base and all their the decision trees are very inaccurate because the, the problem there is overfit and it's, it's a very sim similar problem to nearest neighbors. Um, the solution that people have proposed uh, to, um, to improve decision trees is bootstrap aggregation, which is known as bagging. So that's a resampling technique that I'm going to talk about that helps you with um, dealing with overfit. And so random forest is essentially bagging applied to decision trees with a little bit of variance, uh, variable subsampling. So it's not, this is actually conceptually not a hard um, thing to learn, but, but random forest is a very powerful um, machine learner. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why, why I'm, I'm talking about random forest right now. Um, so random forest is is really great, and in in 2006 uh, there was a uh, a prize offered by uh, Netflix because it was it was the early days of machine learning, and they wanted to um, uh, figure out whether uh, they could predict what movies people are, or TV shows people are going to watch next after they have some data on what you've watched previously. Um, and this was actually one of the catalysts for a lot of um, uh, research in uh, in machine learning, I, mean, I wouldn't say research, more more interest um, uh, by students in in machine learning. And and random forest, although it didn't win the prize uh, in the in the 2007 competition, did very very well. And one of the, some of the advantages of random forest was that it it didn't require you to do very much. So um, in for example. Um, in random forest, overfitting is not a problem. So your model automatically 
will be able to generalize to new data. And that was a problem that they had to deal with in, in many other learners uh, and, and how to exactly get that bias variance trade-off correct. That is to, you know, it was, was very difficult in, in other machine learners. But for random forest, that really, that really wasn't a problem. The other thing that made random forest so great was that, um, and it still is great, is that the training time can be tuned to taste. And what I mean by that is, um, if you have a really um, expensive com or powerful, I should say, computer, then you can run random forest for very long periods of time, and that will let, allow you to squeeze those last little bits of accuracy out of your data. But you can also choose to run it for shorter periods of time, and that'll get you pretty good uh, accuracy. So, you you know, uh, and Random Forest isn't a particularly intense uh, computationally easily because its uh, basic underlying learner is the decision tree. So these days you could probably run a lot of that stuff on your phone. So it's really, it's, it's computationally inexpensive, relatively inexpensive, and it can, uh, but on the other hand, it can take advantage of huge computing uh, resources. But what really made Random Forest uh, take off was that it's just very accurate. So you, um, it, it just works without you having to do a lot of stuff on your own. So, and this is a general property of most uh, uh, kernel-based learners uh, that it, you don't have to specify the um, structure of the relationship between your variables and the output. So just to explain a little bit what I mean by that, um, with regression, you would have to do something like log your variables. If there's a log linear relationship between your variables, you'd maybe put a square term on there to get an up-down kind of relationship. And that's because linear regression, all forms of regression, assume a linear relationship between its the variables and the output. So the only way that you can get something that's not a straight line is to transform your variables. Random force, and because they're based on decision trees, doesn't make use of any of that. And so you don't have to do any of that thinking beforehand or that testing beforehand. You can just throw your data in and it's invariant to any of those, um, what I would, what's called monotone transformations. Finally, um, random forest can elegantly uh, predict more than two classes. And what I mean by that is normally, you know, if I'm showing you logistic regression, the typical example is a two class problem where you have, you know, I'm trying to predict cancer or not cancer. And the reason why uh, this, uh, this kind of, these kind of examples are used when you're talking about regression is because it's, it's really elegantly handled in the logistic regression context. Unfortunately, even with just three classes, things get really ugly with logistic regression. It, it, it can be used, and essentially it's, you know, you're fitting a bunch of logistic regression models and strapping them together with a softmax function, but it's not elegant at all. And But random forest naturally handles this problem. So for all these reasons, random forest has just uh, became a very popular learner. And um, uh, the, uh, if, if you were um, uh, attended module one, I talked a little bit about a famous paper in 2002 written by uh, Leo Brayman in which he compared um, statistical modelers to algorithmic modelers. And this became one of the milestone papers in, in thinking about machine learning and statistics. So Leo Brayman um, was the inventor of Random Forest. And the reason why he started thinking and, and, and uh, the, that paper gained notoriety is because people started using this model. And so his ideas became a little bit more, had a little bit more credibility that, you know, now uh, that we're thinking a little bit more algorithmically, we can sort of abandon our statistical past. But, you know, I think that people have moved on since that paper and, uh, you know, we've sort of come around to understanding how statistics and machine learning fit together, but um, it certainly uh, it changed how people uh, look at the field. Okay, so to start with, I'm going to discuss uh, decision trees, and uh, because that's the basis of of random forest. Um, this topic is covered pretty well in Chapter 9 of Elements of Statistical Learning, and I think that's because one of the authors there um, 
uh, was uh, did a lot of the uh, initial work into decision trees alone as a machine learner. Um, I think I don't think other machine learning texts that I've seen uh, have devoted nearly as much t uh, focus on on this um, this topic alone. But it's if you do want to understand a little bit more about how, what kind of problems they were facing when they worked with decision trees alone, I would I would recommend that chapter. Okay, so here's an example of an extremely simple decision tree. And it, it, here, what I have is some data on some houses. And what I'm trying to predict is um, whether the houses are purple or whether they're blue. Now this seems like, and I have, you know, uh, 10 data points here, and each of these houses has several variables. So um, each house has the color of their uh, roof and the color of the door and a number of windows. So this is a simple visual example because I think I wanted to show you what a simple concept uh, decision trees really are, but this isn't to say that this isn't, uh, this isn't a, a powerful learner. Um, it's just a little bit simpler to describe with only a few variables. So the way that decision trees work is that you're trying to sort um, these different uh, uh, houses uh, into, uh, into their, their classes, which in this case are, are their colors. And I think in, um, in, in all machine learning, that's actually the, all supervised learning, that is, is the problem. But it's only in decision trees where you have this uh, idea of uh, recursively splitting uh, the data into groups based on a single variable. So here's an example. So the, uh, this is our, our, the data that we start with, the, the first 10 houses. And we look at them, and just by eye, we can see that, well, Roof color seems to be a pretty good way of dividing up the houses into blue and, and, and purple. Um, so I'm just going to say, okay, if the roof color is green, I'm going to call it a blue house. And uh, if not, then we're going to put it into this uh, node over here. I'll describe the, that term node a little bit uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, and then in, under this uh, node, uh, we have... Uh, all orange uh, roofed houses, but there still is one house that is not classified the same as the rest. Um, so we say, okay, can we uh, look at another variable and try to split them into the uh, into the correct groups. That means make all of one color appear on one side and all of the other color appear on the other side. And the answer is yes, we can look at the window number and indeed everything Every house that has a orange roof and one window is blue, and every house that has an orange roof and two windows is purple. So that is the basic idea of a decision tree. It's not very complicated, but this is the basis for, for, for random forest. I'm going to explain the, the terms that I use a little bit. Um, so uh, this, uh, the, the little uh, sets of houses are called nodes. And I, um, the, the, this language of uh, nodes, uh, edges, uh, the tree, and forest, it all comes from graph theory and mathematics. And I think it's worthwhile learning the, the terms a little bit because they, they do have applications outside of um, this particular learner and other, other learners, but also gives you a little bit of insight into like why the, the names are the way they are. So um, in, in, in graphs, you have nodes and edges. So the, this uh, group is called the root node because it's what you start with. And um, the, the nodes at the bottom of this tree are, uh, are leaf nodes. And so the reason why they call it a tree is because it's splitting from the roof into different branches. And then the, where the, the, the branch ends, there's a little leaf. So that's kind of a insight into why it's called a tree, because it's kind of like a upside down tree with the root here and the leaves at the bottom. That, that analogy doesn't make sense for some people, but I, I think it's, it's pretty intuitive. Um, so the idea here is that um, as we keep splitting these houses into different uh, groups, what we're doing is we're decreasing their entropy. And um, I think the way that 
most people have encountered that term entropy uh, is in, in physics, maybe, uh, where it, it has a, a different meaning, obviously. But I think uh, the, the reason why we use that term here, it's not, it's not a coincidence. Uh, Claude Shannon, who is the uh, founder of information theory, uh, a, drew a pretty interesting and extremely deep connection between uh, informa um, the information theory uh, and, and, and physics. So the, 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 the equations used in physics for entropy have a similar form as the, as, as the equations for information entropy. But what is entropy um, in, in terms of information theory? Um, entropy is basically how well can I uh, do, do uh, how how similar are the items in this group? So if these houses were exactly split down the middle, so five were blue and five were um, a purple, then that would be the maximum entropy because you have no way of distinguishing between those two classes. They use exactly 50-50. And when you have a node like um, this one, where it's just one, uh, one color, or even this one, they're all actually the minimal entropy, zero entropy, because you, you're sure that, there is, that, that it is um, purple. And um, in, in defining, there are different ways of defining uh, how we're going to measure entropy. Um, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't make too much of a difference. Uh, what the idea is that you're just trying to split these and into and to make the groups as similar as possible. Okay, I wanted to to go through sort of a visual description of a decision tree to show you some of the finer aspects of of, of decision trees and how they can be used for not just categorical variables but also for um, continuous uh, variables as well. So I'm just going to flip to this, this website. Um, it's, it's quite a nice um, uh, mich uh, example of uh, using some visualizations, particularly in D3, to describe um, decision trees. So um, if you, uh, you, can, you can look at this in detail, but uh, it's, I, I'm, I'm just going to focus on a few uh, of the, the points uh, given in this in this example. So um, here they were trying to, they were using a data set about homes um, and uh, they wanted to distinguish New York homes, which are in blue, and San, homes in San Francisco. Um, it's not a very interesting problem, but it illustrates the, um, the decision trees quite well. So if you scroll down, they have some very nice visualizations saying, okay, I'm going to describe um, the, uh, the elevation on San Francisco homes and New York homes. And so uh, they have uh, each home here is given as a bar, and the higher its elevation, the higher it is on, in, this little, in this little graph. So you can see that New York homes are obviously much, much um, shorter, um, but there is an outlier here at 239.5 feet, um, that, uh, but the, most of the homes are, are very, very low. So uh, it, it, if you wanted to classify a house as, uh, uh, as San Francisco or, um, or New York, you could pick probably 239.5 and get um, all of the New York ones right, but only some of the, of the um, San Francisco ones right. Okay. So scrolling down a little bit, they were like, okay, so let's add some more dimensions and maybe we can do a little bit better if we add some other variables to our, our very simple model. So they're saying, okay, we're going to compare on the, on the vertical axis here, they have the elevation in feet and on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, they have some, some price uh, variable. So then they're saying, well, if we draw boundaries, that is, if we say, okay, if we draw square boundaries here, and um, then meaning that, okay, if we say uh, all homes above this um, uh, elevation are San Francisco homes, but if I look at, uh, if I want to recategorize the ones that are below 239 feet, then maybe I can use a different variable here because they're not actually all New York homes, so there's some San Francisco ones mixed in. And this is the essential 
um, basis of decision trees is that you're trying to do this um, splitting of variables, but the structure is in these little blocks because uh, the, that's the way um, splitting things, splitting continuous variables works. Is it, it's basically making fractally nesting these little squares, um, and I guess they become cubes when you when you go to a uh, higher dimension. Um, but to sh uh, so uh, here they just talk about oh actually we have seven different dimensions so we can try different ways of splitting this. But then uh, the most important one is I think looking at um, the histogram here. So here um, they they have the uh, the visualization of the New York homes and the San Francisco homes into some small bins in a histogram. So you can see most of the New York homes are in this bin. The actual um, value of the elevation doesn't matter, just to know that this scale, it's scaled um, from zero to the highest elevation is on the right side. And again, you can see that most of the San Francisco homes, um, most of the high elevation homes are San Francisco homes, but when you have the, you go to the low elevations, you have a kind of a mix uh, between New York and San Francisco homes. Okay, so he's saying that, you know, uh, if you select 248 feet, um, and you try to uh, uh, pick that as your uh, predictor of whether a home is a New York home or San Francisco home, you're going to get all the San Francisco ones correct, or, or in the sense that it, anything above 242 feet uh, is for sure a San Francisco home, but you're not really going to get the ones below it correct. And that's just one way that you can you can choose um, uh, to split these two together. And one thing to notice here is that unlike my example where you of, of houses, uh, this is a continuous variable and not a categorical one. So um, there's other split points that you could pick too. So if you picked um, zero feet, obviously that's just like not doing anything to the data. You're just saying, okay, that's that's what the data, that's the accuracy of just doing nothing, which is saying that um, 111 of the homes were New York and 139 were San Francisco homes. So there's a way of, of measuring accuracy here that they're using, which is a simple one, but an effective one, which is just how many of each, what's the proportion of each that I got correct. It's, it, it's the intuitive uh, way of measuring accuracy. Okay, so if you if you move down a little bit, you can choose different split points. Um, so he's saying that the best split point, according to him, is probably at 91.9 feet. And why is that a good split point? Because although the two branches aren't completely correct, meaning that um, you don't have just one home in either uh, one uh, type of home in either branch uh, of your split, you do have a very high uh, percentage of accuracy. So the best split is not one that puts all of them in just one category, but it's the best split. So um, in, in the footnote to his little notes here, he says, yes, there's actually different ways of calculating the best split, the, the Gini index or the cross entropy, which I'll talk about later. Um, and he's using one called accuracy. It's, uh, and, and so the, the method that you use to determine how good that fit is will um, slightly change where you pick your split point. Okay, so now I'm going to scroll down a little bit further and show you how this works. So in a decision tree, all you're doing is recursively applying this splitting function. You're, whatever um, technique you pick to measure accuracy, you're just continuously splitting it uh, on, on different variables. And you, instead of um, just uh, looking at one variable, Every time you try to split, you look at all possible variables that you could use. And in this one, they have, you know, um, seven different variables. And you could use any one of them. You just pick one which maximizes this, um, this uh, or reduces the entropy, I should say, the best. Um, one thing to note is that um, if you look at the, the tree that he picks, Okay, um, he, he goes down and recursively splits for you, adding several layers until finally um, you have so many branches that every, uh, at the leaf node of every part of this tree, um, you have just one type of home. 
Um, and that's, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But what I want you to notice uh, now is that you can reuse exactly the same variable um, at a different split point at uh, different levels of the tree. So at the start, he's like, okay, elevation seems like a great way to split um, these two uh, into two different groups. And then after that, he chooses, okay, um, uh, price. Um, uh, but the uh, uh, when he when she goes again, um, I, I was saying he was I should say she. Um, when when she goes again, uh, the uh, the elevation is used again. So uh, the the price on the left side uh, in, and on the price is also used again. So um, and the reason why that is is because. This allows the machine learner to use um, uh, several cutoffs for the same variable. So, for example, you could say if the what it is saying is if the elevation is below this level or actually above this level, but also the price is above this level and the elevation is below this level. So it's a really um, exploring some very fine nuances in the data. And uh, it can it can fit, and what what this is equivalent to in regression is really uh, it, it's really not possible in regression because regression would have to form a linear relationship between uh, the, um, uh, the the variables and the, the predictors and their outcome. I shouldn't say it's not possible in regression; it's just not possible without any transformation to your variables. So you would need to do something like fit a spline to it. But with random forest, it can automatically say okay, or uh, decision trees as the basis of random forest can automatically say uh, it should be less than this elevation, but more than this elevation, just depending on whether it's the price is this much. So it's really quite a, uh, it can explore the relationships between the variables in your data quite well. So she goes through the decision tree and, and, and really fits it to, um, uh, the maximal extent, meaning that at the very end, every node, every leaf node has exactly one type of uh, house. And that is uh, trying to decrease the entropy maximally. Um, and then, uh, then uh, the, the problems with that are described in this sort of making predictions section. So if you tried to make predictions on this tree with uh, on the data that you use to build this tree, obviously you're gonna get 100% training accuracy because that's the data that you use. And by definition, it's gonna have 100% accuracy. So uh, that's a very nice sort of Plinko style um, uh, animation there showing the ball, uh, trying to predict new data and then have it follow different paths down the tree. And you can even mouse over to see how the different price functions work or, or not. So um, it, the problem here is of course uh, overfit. So, uh, and that's what she's calling reality check over here. What matters more is how the tree performs on previously unseen data. Um, and, and this is where you really start to see what the problem is with decision trees on its own. If you, uh, if you just keep branching out these, this tree as far as it can possibly go, then you're going to start uh, fitting some very, um, uh, you're going to start fitting the model to a very small number of data points. So ideally, um, this, this tree should perform just as well on the data that you tested on as, the, as new data sets. And that's because you want to get an idea of how accurate your decision tree is going to be in practice. Um, but if you if you overfit like this, you're not going to get that kind of accuracy, and that's because in in here you're going to be fitting uh, at the very bottom. You're going to be fitting to very very low number of, of data points. So this this split at the very end is probably based on just one or two different houses, and so there's it's very likely that those were just flukes or outliers, and that's the the idea of the the bias variance trade-off. This is a nice, um, uh, I thought it would be a nice visualization to show because it's, it's nice to play with and I try to understand what it means to do overfitting. So I encourage you to play with it a little bit. And it has um, a, another section which
which explains um, overfitting in a little bit more detail that is not uh, specific to decision trees. Okay, so now to go back, how do you measure the accuracy of a split? So in that um, in that uh, web page, they had uh, the the misclassification error, which is used as the way they measured how good each split was. But there's different ways of doing it, and the specific details don't matter that much. the The one that Leo Brayman used, uh, who is the founder of Random Forest, was the Gini Impurity Index. And you might have heard Jeannie's name before in the context of um, an economic indicator. And it is actually the same Corrado Gini, who uh, I think is an Ital was an Italian economist, but uh, in like the early 1900s. Uh, and he had a bunch of different ways of measuring uh, inequalities uh, in different, I think he, he was doing di amongst different countries or different neighborhoods um, in terms of uh, uh, income inequalities. So uh, the Gini impurity is not exactly the same index that, that people typically associate with the Gini index, but it was in the same paper. Um, Leo Brayman uh, didn't use that on purpose. I think it was just he, he came up with a, a measure of his own and then later found out that it was it was actually described by, by Gini beforehand. Um, so the idea is that you just have to find some way of, of measuring whether a split is good or bad and comparing those splits to different uh, uh, in different ways. So in the element, this, this figure here, figure 9.3, is from the chapter 9 elements of statistical learning. And it describes different impurity measures, different way of measuring that um, for, uh, uh, for a two-class classification problem. So P here represents um, the proportion of, uh, uh, of the, the items, so like the units, like the houses, in, in one node. So if it's at... 50%, meaning that there's an even split between the two classes you want to predict, then this impurity index, this um, uh, entropy is at its maximum. And then it's it's symmetric on both sides of P because it's obviously equivalent um, on, on both sides. But it's, this is just to show you that it doesn't really matter how, how you do it. The misclassification error, error is going to be like this, a triangular shape because of its uh, its... Uh, just because of its mathematical properties, I guess. Um, but the Gini index and the entropy, um, cross entropy, are very, very similar. You can go in and look at the details of those equations. I didn't want to show you the, them here, but just to, to know um, when you're looking through uh, the parameters in Random Forest, this is what they, they mean. The, um, in my experience using Random Forest and from the theoretical properties, it really doesn't matter that much. It just matters that you have a symmetric measure on both sides that is decreasing as entropy decreases. Okay, so the advantages and disadvantages of, of decision trees. So the advantages of kernel-based methods uh, like this one is that feature engineering, and what I mean by feature engineering is doing that, like taking logs and doing polynomial transformations, is not as important. In fact, Random Forest is totally insensitive to any monotone transformation. If you do those uh, logs and, 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 and uh, polynomials, it's not going to do anything for Random Forest, which is great because nobody wanted to do those in the first place. Because it, it, often we have thousands of variables and we're not sure exactly what the relationship between our variable and our uh, predictors are. So it's a really nice advantage of Random Forest. Additionally, variable interactions are very well explored. And what I mean by that is multiplying variables together um, is something that you typically see in like an epidemiologic study um, and many scientific studies. Uh, typically, people try to do interactions between two variables in regression, sometimes three. But what decision trees are really doing is ex taking variable interactions, exploring them in this extremely systematic and complete way. So um, what this means is, is that you know, you're not, nobody puts in three-way interactions in regression ter in, in regression because it, it looks kind of ridiculous and it's hard to, to interpret, I think, is the, is the main reason. But what this does here is automate that process and, and allow you to take advantage of some, some of those um, interactions that you probably wouldn't have tried in the first place with, with regression.
So nonlinear functions are well approximated hands-free. So what I mean by that is you don't have to do much and you can get this very complicated um, structure in your predictions, but you don't have to do much to get it. And this is, this is the heart of the, uh, the um, popularity of random forest. The other nice thing is that decision trees are really, really easy to explain. So you can just give this model to somebody as a flowchart, and they know exactly how it, how it works just from looking at it. In a, in, and and I've actually seen this done in uh, the case of uh, in in medicine. So the Ottawa, uh, I think they're the Ottawa ankle rules. A very nice way of predicting whether you should send a fracture for a radiology exam. So the person comes in with a fracture and uh, radiology is very expensive. So you wanna rule out the, the ankle fractures that are probably not uh, very serious. And so there's a couple of, uh, there's a decision tree that you can use for that and predict very, and rule out um, a serious injury uh, very easily. So, and that's, it's a nice advantage is there, not a black box at all. It's, it's very easy to understand. And not only that, but it kind of corresponds with a process that a lot of people naturally do to split people up into groups and, and, and use this. They, they naturally develop this as their own hypothesis. Lastly, they're really fast to train. So uh, even if you have a very, very simple uh, computer, you can do all of this and very huge amounts of data. You can do this stuff in seconds. Um, decision trees are, are very, not very computationally intense. The hardest part is really trying to pick the, um, the, the split points for, for continuous variables. Um, but the major disadvantage is that they're going to overfit your problem. So if you go back to this simple decision tree that I was describing earlier, that prediction where I'm, I'm circling in red there is really based on one data point. And while I can bet that in this data, the, you know, the roof color uh, seems to be a good variable to split on, the, the window uh, is really is saying that all houses that are, have orange roofs and one window are going to be blue is based on exactly one data point, which is pretty weak. And that is exactly the kind of thing that you want to prevent because the main problem in machine learning is overfit. So this relates it, um, decision trees uh, back to uh, uh, another learner, a kernel-based learner called Nearest Neighbor. So this is a, a learner that I described in module one, um, where they talked about uh, uh, building a predictor of orange and blue dots based on these two variables. So the horizontal axis is one variable and the uh, vertical axis is another variable. It doesn't matter exactly what they are, they're just both continuous. And the, the thing you're trying to predict is whether they're orange or blue. Um, and the way that one nearest neighbor classifier predicts them is just based on how many uh, points are, are, like what's the closest point. So if I were to predict a new value here, I would say, well, the closest point to that value is, is blue literally by the, the, the uh, measured distance here. Um, and so I'm gonna predict that it's blue. And these black lines show the boundaries. So saying that anything in this region will therefore be picked blue because this is the closest point to it. And what I was describing in that module is that one nearest neighbor classifier is an incredibly overfit model because uh, it, it it is extremely susceptible to outliers. So we can see that there's a general trend in the sort of upper left quadrant that they're mostly orange. Um, but this, there's this one blue dot over here, and I don't think this is this um, boundary is going to generalize very well. I think this is just a outlier, and we should probably. Um, um, uh, not predict that uh, any point in this region is going to be blue, but that it's going to be orange. But the problem is, you know, where do you draw the line? With nearest neighbor, you can easily start drawing the line by using different numbers of nearest neighbors. So I could go up to maybe two nearest neighbors, three nearest neighbors, 15 nearest neighbors, and see how well that generalizes on new data with, uh, with cross-validation. 
Um, so decision trees are actually really similar to nearest neighbor. This is the sort of closest um, in, in the family of supervised uh, kernel learners um, because they're, they're kind of doing the same thing, except instead of splitting the data up into these very um, sort of radial boundaries, they're splitting the data up into these blocky um, uh, cubes or, 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 or squares in the case of two dimensions. So how do you deal with overfit and decision trees? In, in nearest neighbor, you can just try to fit the, uh, you can try to reduce the number of neighbors, but with, uh, with decision trees, it gets really hard because you, can, you have to restrict the number of, uh, you, can, you can try things like restricting the number of splits. So you can say, well, my trees can only branch so far down you can try to say there's a minimum entropy decrease on each split, but choosing those parameters it just becomes, you're just moving the problem to another parameter. And so you're going to have to do cross validation on that. And it's, it's not, um, they, they tried a lot of things and you'll see that if you do read chapter nine and the elements of statistical learning, but there was no real success there. Uh, it, it, decision trees never became a very, popular machine learner on their own. They're mostly used in, in an ad hoc setting in, in medicine. The real breakthrough came when, with random forest, which is really one small tweak to decision trees to deal with overfit. And, and that is bootstrap aggregation combined with variable subsampling. So that's the um, the section that I want to uh, describe right now. Uh, in the section random forest, I'll describe what bootstrap aggregation is and uh, and variable subsampling. Okay, so bootstrap is a very famous um, statistical. Uh, method that was developed by Efron and it's probably one of the major advances in frequentist statistics, maybe all of statistics. It was definitely a game-changing event inside of the world of statistics. And it, it got in, in machine learning takes advantage of it in, in, in the sense of begging. Efron was, I think, the, the PhD supervisor of Tichirani. So I think in, in the book, Elements of Statistical Learning, they really gets quite a deep treatment that perhaps isn't warranted uh, at that level. But I think it's just because they're so excited by it and know the, the structure and properties of the method um, uh, very well. Um, but I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of a rundown of what it is, and then I'll tell you about why it works and, and how it's used. So on the, on the left side, uh, I'm showing a very small data set that you might have with three observations and two variables, just some X and Y. The idea is that bootstrap replication is really just resampling with replacement. So um, all that means is, I'm going to make a new data set out of the old one by just randomly picking um, uh, uh, units and, uh, and they can repeat. So here I say, okay, first one I pick is three and then I, I don't like take it out of the original data, I leave it in and then I pick another one and then I pick another one. So as you can see, even though there was one, two, three in here, when I sample again, um, it's three, one, three. So the order really doesn't matter, but you can see that two is left out of here. I, I try it again and I end up resampling the original data set. And then I sample again and I end up sampling uh, exactly uh, two twice and one once. There's um, two things to note here. Uh, one is that uh, in each of the, each of these is called bootstrap replicates. So in each of the bootstrap replicates, some of the observations are missing. So in this one, um, uh, one is missing, and this one is zero are missing, and this one, uh, one is missing. Um, and there's an interesting uh, proof that uh, it's actually the number of, of observations that are missing is one over E, where E is Euler's number. And there's a, it's, a, it's a really fascinating um, uh, proof to go through, and it shows you a little bit about how E works, but that's not quite important. What is important is that um, about one third uh, of the observations are going to be missing out of each of these bootstrap replicates. 
Okay, so this is kind of weird. Why, why would we do this anyways, is, is the real question. Um, the idea is, is that in statistics, they developed this because um, they wanted to uh, try to understand how to develop uh, variance estimates for um, some very complicated models. So in the old days, uh, they could, when they had simpler models, they could find closed form estimates for things like, okay, what's the confidence interval around this regression parameter? And we can, and, and what, how are we going to find the, the estimator of this kind of attributable risk, whatever. And all that stuff um, uh, worked and you could do it very quickly. Um, then they started building more and more advanced models and it started to become more and more unclear how to make variance estimates. And what the real trick about bootstrap is, is that instead of trying to do the hard math, they just kind of do this brute force technique of trying to find what the underlying variance is. So um, if you have a very complicated method, it's really difficult to understand how the variance is calculated. The math is, is really difficult. But the, what Efron really introduced was the idea that if you just say, say you were trying to estimate the parameter of your very complicated regression. He said, well, you can just do this bootstrap replication, fit the model like hundreds of times, and then look at the distribution of that parameter, and that'll get you the variance. And that was really the bootstrap. And it's, it's kind of amazing. It really works. If you look at the, uh, the original data on the replicates over here, um, I've just I'm doing the resampling again with uh, with these 10 houses. So the way, reason why I'm introducing this is because all random forest really is, is taking, oops, taking those uh, uh, replicates, making hundreds and hundreds of them, and then running a decision tree on each of them. So if you, if you see here, I've said, okay, I'm taking this replicate, I'm gonna find the best split here, it just works doing just the, the, the roof color. And then I'm going to do it again on this replicate. Here I have another decision tree. So then I'm going to come up with hundreds of decision trees. Here I'm only showing two. Then when I go to predict this data in a new data point, I just have all the trees vote. So I say, okay, out of my hundreds of uh, trees, um, I tested it on all the possible decision trees, and then I take a majority vote, and that's what the random forest is predicting. And that's why they call it random forest, because I'm taking a bunch of trees and making a forest out of it, that's the analogy, and they're all random because I'm taking random bootstrap um, replicates. So um, begging, which is this uh, technique in general, is uh, that word comes from bootstrap aggregation, because I'm taking a bunch of bootstrap replicates uh, and then uh, aggregating them by having the trees vote uh, on new data. Normally you have an odd number of trees so that you don't get ties in the voting, um, but it, that's not really uh, important. Um, one interesting thing here is that bootstrap aggregation that is begging is not, it doesn't necessarily have to apply to uh, decision trees. You could do begging on regression or any of nearest neighbor or whatever. It's just, it's a general technique. One thing that I should probably mention now is that um, in random forest, uh, thousands of trees are typically fit. And beware the defaults in the in the packages. I'll show you in the in the session on Thursday. But in R in particular, I think the number of trees is set really really low. Like uh, I think like 50. That's really not sufficient for any data set that I've come across these days. So it, it's something more like 20,000 is the number of trees that you you want to to fit. So beware the defaults in some of these packages. Also, the proportion of trees voting, meaning like are is not cannot be interpreted as a probability. This is not a statistical model like GLM, and it doesn't automatically have these statistical interpretations that you might think they would. So you can modify with a bit of post-processing um, the, the output of the, the voting proportion of trees to become a probability. You just run it through logistic regression, basically. But it's not, can't be interpreted directly as a probability, which is very important in some scientific scenarios. So the only additional pro thing with bagging is that um, if even if you do run bootstrap aggregation on, say, on even that 
small 10 house data set, the first uh, um, split in almost every replicate is going to be the house color. And why? Because the house color was the most common thing. And it's, it's not going to, and most of the trees are still going to look pretty similar. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that the trees are going to be correlated because the first split is going to be uh, the same. So the, the only other additional thing that makes it random forest is that they use variable subsampling. So in each split, instead of trying to split on every possible variable, they take a sample of the number of variables. So that means that if I have like say 12 variables to fit on, I'm going to only look at, um, say, three variables and find the best split amongst those. And what this does is it randomizes things a little bit more. It puts the importance randomly on a, a different set of variables. And this is going to have the same effect that the bootstrap does in general. It's going to leave out the outliers. And that's, the, that's sort of the intuition that I wanted to give you with why variable subsampling uh, works and why bagging works in general. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit as well about one of the advantages of random forest, which is uh, that you automatically are basically doing cross-validation. So in, you never ever do cross-validation on random forest. Uh, it's, it's totally redundant. So if you saw in the first module, um, cross-validation is basically splitting up the data set into um, uh, N different um, sets where you have a, a portion of the set marked as uh, test and a portion marked as train. And then you fit, say, five different models and you train it on just the train part and then you measure accuracy on the test part. So in some sense, when you have bootstrap replicates, it's already a fold on whatever is left out. So if you go back to that original data set that I was talking about before, in uh, this bootstrap replicate, I've only trained on data points three and one, so it can be used as a predictor for two, because I didn't train it on two. So I just collect all the trees that were trained on on um, uh, uh, on everything except for that uh, variable, and that, and then I, I vote, uh, and, and that's the prediction for, for that particular uh, data point, and I repeat it for every possible data point in the um, in in my data set, and then so then I get uh, what's called the out of bag error, which is very very similar to cross validation, but the advantage is is that I've already calculated it when I make my predictor, which is another great advantage of random forest that I don't really have to do this hard work of fitting several different models. I can just keep running it and running it and updating my out of bag error as I go, and that's so when you're uh, running it on your machine, that's what I kind of mean by you can tune to taste is that you can um, you can say okay I'm going to instead of saying I'm going to run it till uh, uh, till it reaches 20,000 trees I can say I'm going to run it until my out of bag error until the error that I predicted like this is going to reach some threshold and then I'm going to stop because uh, uh, but with cross validation you can't do that because you have to pre-specify what the um, uh, uh, how how you're going to fit each model before you perform cross validation. So, for example, you'd have to specify the number of trees. Okay, so uh, a bit of a summary here. Um, why are we going to use random forest? One, as I was saying before, out of bag error is built in cross validation. This is a really nice application of of random forest. And what's even more interesting is that you can just keep you can just keep running it in the background. And some in some places they do do that. And this is one of the uh, if you think about online learning where you have instead of a scientific data set where the data set is already there um, and and fixed, you can have situations where um, data is is incoming. Um, like if you have some web application or something where there's constantly data in a similar way, you can constantly update your predictions. Another thing is that random forest, the more trees you have, the more accurate it gets. Obviously, it's approaching some asymptote, uh, but you, you can, 
if you really need that sixth decimal place of accuracy, you can get it. Uh, you can try to squeeze more out of it by just running more trees. But uh, the real nice thing about Random Forest is that you don't have to do much uh, of this feature engineering. Uh, it explores interactions very well. You can kind of just dump in your variables and, and let it run, which is, you know, probably not as recommended in other, in other learners like, um, like regression or regularization. Okay, so if you want to do some additional reading on this topic, as I was saying before, the elements of statistical learning uh, has a very nice chapter uh, on, in chapter 15 on random forests. They talk a little too much about decision trees, um, but it's still, it's still worthwhile reading if you want to get a deeper understanding. And Murphy has a nice um, probabilistic perspective um, on random forest. A lot of the, the machine learning methods that uh, do focus on um, uh, probabilistic interpretations leave random forest out because it's it doesn't have a nice probabilistic interpretation in some senses. I'm going to stop for a question now. Andre's question is, could you please elaborate on how you choose the model to represent the solution of the random forest? In other words, how do you aggregate the results across trees? Okay, okay. I think I think I get what you're saying. Yeah, maybe. Um, so uh, you you literally have the trees just you run each of the trees. So um, let me just go back to the example. So here, if I have this uh, simple random forest with just say I ran just two trees on it, I would say okay, I have a new data point that has uh, a green a green roof and maybe. Um, like one window or, or whatever. I say, okay, this tree basically predicts that all green uh, uh, roofs are blue. So that's your vote, a, green, uh, a, a blue house. And on the, on the right side, I have another tree that says, okay, well, you know, if it has um, maybe a green, if it has, let's just say it has an orange roof. So if it has an orange roof, then well, it, it you know, this one predicted um, uh, purple, but this one says that if it's if it's an orange roof and it has you know a yellow door and it has one window, then it's blue. So this this uh, this tree says that it's going to be blue. So then you do that for all your thousands and thousands of trees, and you pick the majority uh, wins. And that's why you don't normally fit uh, even number of um, trees so that you just prevent this uh, ties from happening. But that's impossible when you have multiple classes. But it's, I think uh, hopefully that answers your, uh, your question on how voting works. So you select a tree that maximizes the accuracy of prediction on the test data? No, 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 it's not that. So um, you don't select a tree. So your model is the entire set of trees, the forest that is. So you just keep running uh, the decision trees and you store all of those thousands and thousands of decision trees uh, as your model. Then uh, once you have those thousands and thousands of decision trees, when you have a new data point, you wanna predict something, you ask each of the trees, because you don't know how accurate any of those trees alone are, you ask each of the trees, say, okay, make a prediction on this one data point. And so each of your decision trees makes a prediction. And now you say, okay, well, 52% of the trees said that this house is gonna be purple. So I'm gonna say it's purple because a majority of the trees voted purple. And that's, that's how random forest works. You never select trees because uh, you, you random forest just builds more and more decision trees because you, you have no way of measuring the accuracy of a prediction on a specific tree. In fact, you don't actually split data into testing and training sets, uh, unlike other machine learners. If you want to learn a little bit more about the theory, how it works, there's uh, the, the elements of statistical learning is really the way to go. And you can probably play with some of the examples in that text because they're, they're also given in R.